We are back, comeback period nation, for day two of week two previews, and we're starting out with the first game on Sunday, the Birmingham Stallions at the Michigan Panthers in Detroit at Ford Field. And we've got the full preview for you today, not only from James Larson with Pro Football Newsroom, but we've got the injury report and a little bit of a preview from the UFL themselves. Let's go ahead and dive right on into this without any further ado. We are talking about the injury reports with the uh, Birmingham Stallions. First and foremost, we have DeMarcus Gates, uh, inside linebacker, right knee injury. He had full uh, practice on our uh, participation on Wednesday and Thursday. Um, highly expect him to be playing on Sunday in this game. Then we have uh, Adrian Martinez, quarterback, right foot injury. He had limited um practice on Wednesday and then full practice on Thursday. My guess would he would be the starting quarterback or not starting, but the backup quarterback for Bar Birmingham on Sunday. Um, but if there is any question, uh, we could see Jamar Smith activated for that second spot. Then we have Ike Brown, cornerback, left foot injury. He did not practice on Wednesday, and he did not practice on Thursday. My guess is he probably is not going to be ready for the game on Sunday, and when this injury report updates, either later tonight or early tomorrow, we'll probably see him being out on Sunday. So count Ike Brown out there. But then we move on to the Michigan Panthers. Uh, wide receiver John Hightower, left ankle injury, did not practice on Wednesday, but did have limited practice practice on Thursday. My guess is game uh, game time decision. Uh, the next two um, or three could be game time decisions. We have Breland Speaks, uh, defensive end, left foot injury, did not practice on Wednesday, had limited on Thursday. Jarrett Horst, uh, tackle, left knee injury, did not practice Wednesday, limited practice on Thursday. Then we have Ryan Pope, tackle, right shoulder injury, limited practice Wednesday, and limited practice on Thursday. And then running back, Nate McCray, left hip injury, limited practice on Wednesday, full practice on Thursday. He most likely will be um, part of the play on Sunday, but we'll see once the depth charts come out. They have not been released yet for this game. Uh, I'm expecting later today, most likely. Um, it's usually about 48 hours prior. They have been pretty good about that with uh, yesterday's games. We got those in time. So let's go ahead and move over to the UFL's notes of this game. And they are going back to last week with one of the most history-making plays in the UFL last week and almost in football. And that, of course, is none other than Michigan Panthers kicker Jake Bates. He kicked his way into football history after drilling a 64-yard field goal with three seconds left in the game against St. Louis in Week 1. The 64-yarder is tied for the second-longest field goal in professional football history, only behind Justin Tucker's 66-yard field goal, which he connected on in 2021 at that exact same location in Ford Field. Bates tied Matt Prater, who hit a 64-yard field goal in 2013 with the Denver Broncos. I was at that game, actually. It was against the Tennessee Titans. It was very cold. It was like negative, I think, three out or some crazy stuff like that. Wind chilled made it like negative 10. It was me and my uncle that went to that game, and I could not believe what we witnessed with that um, field goal. So very interesting. But then what makes Bates' field goal even more impressive is the fact that he had not kicked a field goal at all prior to this, this kick. Um, he did not kick a uh, field goal in high school or in college. There were some rumors that he had kicked in high school before. That is not the case here. Um, when you look at it, um, the fact that he was a kickoff specialist from high school to college. Um, he has kicked extra points. He went two for three for the Houston Texans in uh, 2023 during preseason. But the fact is, he kicked this field goal twice. Let's not forget that. So he was iced on the first one, or they tried to ice him on the first one by the St. Louis uh, Battlehawks coaching staff. But then he did it again. It could have easily probably broke the record looking at the kick and looking at the replay. That kick probably could have been good from 67, potentially 68 yards, depending on it. It went perfect, and it was it was pretty high up. It wasn't low or just. 
So let's move on. So new year, new results at Ford Field. So we all know last season the in the USFL, Michigan Panthers struggled at home at Ford Field. They only had one win out of the five games um, that essentially they played at Ford Field. Um, after starting 0-4 in their friendly confinements, the Panthers defeated the Philadelphia Stars 23-20 and earned a playoff berth with their first home win in five games. Michigan was outscored 127-66 to by its opponents last year, but this year in 2024, though, the Panthers have matched their win total in the Motor City with a 18-16 win over St. Louis in Week 1. The 16 points are the fewest points ever allowed by Michigan while playing at Ford Field, which is crazy to think. In just a year, in what they've done uh, to kind of get themselves back. Now, of course, if it wasn't for that kick, they wouldn't have won that game. So we've got to give uh, credit where credit is due to Jake Bates on that and just the fact that he got them to where they're at with that win. So let's go ahead and dive into James Larson's Preview of this game, week two of the UFL continues with what will be an intriguing matchup between two 1-0 teams. The Michigan Panthers host the Birmingham Stallions with an opportunity to take control of the USFL conference, depending on who comes out on top. Um, taking a quick look at last week, the Birmingham Stallions looked like the team to beat. After a slow start against Arlington, the second half was scary. was a scary sight as the Renegades fell by double digits. Matt Corral and company came alive, and Birmingham's defense looked better than ever. I can't disagree with that. Uh, Mission, on the other hand, had an unbelievable finish against St. Louis. When all looked lost with less than a minute to go, we, we've all heard the story by now, and we just talked about when Jake Bates saved the day. The Panthers got away with one late, but will have to show signs of improvement this week against the back-to-back -back champions. Now, when we switch over to quarterback play, Matt Corral seemed to figure things out pretty quickly on Saturday. Not surprisingly, it took him a few drives to get his legs under him. Once he accomplished that, the Stallions took over control and never looked back. And I, I said that. I knew if the Stallions got their game on front, when the media went back to uh, the press event with uh, Dwayne Johnson, it took a little bit of time for him to come in after kickoff. And we had a TV monitor in there watching. I said, once the Stallions, I told everyone, once the Stallions get their motion going, this game's over with. And that's exactly what happened. So, All right, a little bit of a, a technical difficulty there with the cord on my mic fell out. So we're back here. Anyways, um, so it wasn't the – we'll start over. Corell's uh, sole interception of the day wasn't even his fault as the ball slipped right into Deion Kane's hands. According to uh, PFF, Matt's offensive grade was a 77.5 and his passing grade was even better at an 85.6. The former third round NFL draft pick is already looking like an MVP candidate for Skip Holtz if he can continue to keep growing from week to week. Um, now, it is expected that Adrian Martinez will be utilized. His legs resemble that of Alex Magoo and Holtz loves to use two quarterbacks so prepare to see Adrian take a drive or two on Sunday. Uh, Michigan's defense performed quite well against McCarron, but will have to face uh, yet have to face the dual threat abilities of Corral and Martinez. Now, of course, with that, as we talked about, Adrian Martinez quarterback had a right foot injury and was limited practice Tuesday, Wednesday, and then full practice yesterday. That could be a little bit of a concern. Even if he is healthy, that could be a concern that he could essentially re-aggravate that injury, which could activate Jamar Smith at that point. So keep an eye on that. Um, but as for EJ Perry, there is some work to do. He had the lowest uh, PFF grades of any quarterback this weekend and committed five turnover-worthy plays, more than double of any other UFL signal caller. Now, it wasn't all bad. Once Perry remembered that he could use his legs instead of trying to play hero ball, Michigan's offense began to get it going. That second half was impressive as EJ continued to put the Panthers back in the game, even after taking some major shots from St. Louis. Um, against an optimistic or opportunistic uh, Birmingham defense, 
Perry can't afford to make those mental mistakes, especially early. With another week of practice under his belt, his play should be cleaner in week two. And I, I agree. I think that once you start getting those motions going, it's going to take a while for these teams to really – get back together and usually we've seen in spring football around week three to week five is kind of those key spots where teams start really playing well but again in a 10 week season can't really fool around with that and we've kind of seen that with uh, spring footballs in the past with the usfl in 2022 2023 xfl in 2020 and 2023 it's it's just a how it goes um i think they've had a lot more advantage this year with the practices and everything like that and team rosters kind of coming back together from former teams, things like that. Um, One thing here, though, is standout playmakers. Birmingham has such a complete offense across the board. After his uh, early drop, Deion Kane became a go-to guy for Correll, and that should stay the same this week. He totaled 66 receiving yards and a a score this week uh, past weekend. Uh, Jace Sternberger was relatively quiet with two catches for 32 yards, but it's only a matter of time before he starts putting numbers up like he did in 2023. Uh, the running back tandem of CJ Marbell, Marbell and Ricky Pearson Jr. proved to be one of the best in the UFL. The two combined for 98 rushing yards and also made an impact catching the ball out of the backfield. Uh, Pearson, in particular, had an excellent day with an 88.1 offensive grade per PFF. Um, the Michigan Panthers are going to continue are g- going to continue to lean on running back Wes Hills, who had an outstanding Week uh, One performance. Hills led all rushers with 85 yards and sparked a couple of their scoring drives against St. Louis. Uh, now, of course, their wide receivers have to find a way to get more involved. Now, part of this is Perry getting them involved, but generally speaking, Mission doesn't have that wide receiver one that pops off in the depth chart. Devin Ross and Marcus Sims both made some impressive plays, and one would hope that Perry uh, will target John Hightower a bit more this weekend. Um, Hightower only saw 19 snaps, but made arguably the most clutch play of the day with a reception on fourth and six during their final drive. Now, again, going back to that injury report, Hightower did have a left ankle injury and did not practice on Tuesday, Wednesday, and had limited practice on Thursday. I still think he could potentially be a game decision, um, if he'll play or not. So keep that in mind for Michigan with James uh, talking here about he needs to be targeted. He may not even be playing. So keep an eye on that. That could that could be a sign of a weakness for the Michigan Panthers. Um, two stout defenses. So the Michigan Panthers came away with a win in week one due to their defense efforts. Their defensive line and front seven as a whole set the tone for St. Louis could uh, set the tone. St. Louis could not run the ball, which led to the Battlehawks being backed up often and early. In the secondary, Nate Brooks, Keith Gibson, and Bryce uh, Thornton and uh, Kai Nakua all had solid games. There were a couple of slip-ups in crunch time, though. Um, Example, Gibson on uh, Marcel Aitman. Something to watch this week will be how this unit handles a Stallions lineup of former NFL draft picks like Deion Kane and Amari Rogers. Uh, the trenches will be a bit tougher for Michigan this week. They'll have to worry about the mobility of Corral and Martinez. Uh, Colin Bauer's uh, defense was excellent stopping the run in week one, but they'll have a true challenge, especially with Birmingham's offensive line being one of the best in the league. For the Stallions, their defense was fantastic when it came to applying pressure on Luis Perez, especially in the second half. However, similar to Michigan's situation, they will now face a more mobile and dynamic signal caller this week. Carlos Davis, Jonathan Garvin, uh, Dondre Tillman, and etc. cannot allow EJ to easily escape the pocket. In the secondary, uh, Lorenzo Burns and Mark Gilbert were special in week one. Gilbert doesn't belong in this league. Um, He 
He allowed zero receptions on two targets and came up with an interception and recover fumble. A strong PFF grade of 91.9 to start his season. That said, one sore spot is Chris Jackson. He gave up eight catches for 113 yards and a score against Arlington. If he's primarily in the slot again this week, the Panthers have to target Trey Quinn and Devin Gray often and early. When we look at the coaching uh, matchup here, we obviously know Michigan Panthers there's Mike Nolan. Nolan is in his second season of coaching in Michigan. He's got a bit of a different role this year as Colin Bauer, uh, his new defensive coordinator, is now calling the defense. This has allowed Mike to have a bit more time on the sidelines to see the big picture, which he believes was quite helpful in their week one win. Coach Nolan, with a statement on his upcoming game against Birmingham, said, I think we match up pretty well. They are a very good football team. They've won the league two years in a row. They've beat a good team and the other day in it or they beat a good team the other day and it wasn't even close. They'll be a very good opponent. I would say the comparison is that St. Louis is a little more prototypical in their style of offense, and Birmingham is a bit more of a college style. They do a lot with their quarterbacks. Uh, Birmingham utilizes the quarterback position extremely well, and they use and they use them to not only pass but also run the ball. When we look at Birmingham Stallions with Skip Holtz, Holtz is one of the most lovable coaches in all of football. He's perfect for the spring football scene, and his team is humming to start the UFL season. To no surprise, no one's surprised at that point, with his leadership, this Birmingham team is 22-3 and three, uh, total. Last year, Holtz got his best of Nolan as Birmingham came away 27-13 victory. In final thoughts for James, he says, well, the Michigan Panthers are an extremely talented team and better than a year ago, so is Birmingham. It's difficult to pick against the Stallions until they actually start losing. Given their week one success, I'd pick Birmingham as the favorites to win the game. That said, you cannot count out Michigan yet. Last week, was a perfect example example of that. St. Louis Battlehawks were heavily favored, yet the Panthers came away with a victory. It's also no, also worth noting that both Birmingham and Michigan featured two of the best offensive lines in Week One. Hopefully, this means we'll see clean play throughout the game between these two units. Um, again, the Michigan Panthers will host the Birmingham Stallions this Sunday at 12 p.m. Eastern Time on ESPN. So that wraps up. Game number three of the week, which will be on Sunday with the Birmingham Stallions and the Michigan Panthers. Let me know in the comments uh, who you think will win this game, what the final score will be. Um, I am getting pickums out tonight. Uh, my children decided they wanted to go play uh, more last night. Me and my wife decided to go have date night and go bowling. Um, so then this morning I was going to do it and my daughter already walked out the door by the time I had everything ready to go for school. Then we had to get the others to school. So we'll be doing that tonight. Um, and then I will probably start getting these recorded on Monday and get them out sometime during the week. So they're not last minute or anything like that and giving you more of the chance to do pick them. So make sure you hit the subscribe button, hit the like button and hit that notification button, um, for any updates at the comeback period post and we'll see you back here on the next one. Have a great one, everyone.